Hello and welcome to the 13th Annual Romance Readers Social with the Flugel Library. I'm Meg Miller, adult services librarian. Um, we have an amazing lineup of authors for you. And even though we are virtual this year, I tried to bring some of the spirit of the event to today um, with some decoration. If you've got a guest swag bag, there's a sweet treat in there, along with the other goodies from our authors and the library. Uh, we love our crafts around here, as I said. I definitely still use some of my previous romance readers' crafts. Um, like, I have these earrings that were laser cut. Um, so today we'll also start with a really easy to make sun catcher. Um, I really appreciate our office for indulging me with this. Um, if you've not picked up your bag or are farther away, don't worry, the craft portion will be quick and we'll chat our way through it. Speaking of chatting, um, we've got the chat available. Um, we expect all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness in the chat. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any kind of harassment, may at our discretion be immediately removed. Thank you all participants and authors for being here today. We also have some great questions, but if anyone has other questions, there is a Q&A function, um, or my coworker Erin here is, help, is here today to help monitor the chat. Uh, and now allow me to do some introductions for our illustrious authors that you see here. Um, so I have Carolyn Sparks, apparently has reality issues, issues with reality of the best. After writing 16 books about vampires, she now has gone completely off the deep end and wound up on another planet. And how thrilling that she can share her magical world and be embraced with her readers. Although she is best known so far for the Love at Stake series, which has hit as high as number five on the New York Times list and 22 on the USA Today list, she hopes her readers will also love the Embrace series. Tracy Lipsay's latest release, Like Lovers Do, was named one of the 100 best fiction books of 2020 by Kirkus Reviews and one of the top 10 romances of 2020 by Entertainment Weekly. She's the 2020 Emma Award winner for Best Interracial Romance for Sweet Talking Lovers. Congratulations. In addition to being named to USA Today's list of 100 Black novelists you should read, she's been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and on CBS This Morning. A former criminal defense attorney, Tracy lives in Virginia with her children and her husband, who she met on the first day of law school. Sajni Patel was born in vibrant India and raised in the heart of Texas, surrounded by a lot of delicious food and plenty of diversity. She draws on her personal experiences, cultural expectations, and Southern flair to create worlds that center around strong Indian women. Once an MMA, she's now all about puppies and rainbows and tortured love stories. She currently lives in Austin, where she not so secretly watches Matthew McConaughey from afar during UT games. Don't read that one. Queso is her weakness, and thanks to her family's cooking, Indian Tex-Mex cuisine is a real thing. She's a diehard Marvel Comics fan and a lover of chocolates from around the world and is always wrapped up in a story. And we have Lorraine Heath, always dreamed of being a writer. After graduating from the University of Texas, she wrote training manuals and computer code, but something was always missing. When she read a romance novel, she became not only hooked on the genre, but quickly realized what her writing lacked. Rebels, scoundrels, and rogues. She's been writing about them ever since. Her work has been recognized with numerous industry awards, including Art of Ewing's Rita. Her novels have appeared on the USA Today and New York Times bestseller list. Thank you, ladies, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to chat and make sure. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to start with the crap. You've got the supplies. Um, this is also something really, it is some monocord or fishing line. So, if you have um, significant others that fish, you can grab some of the line. Um, there are some beads. Uh, I laser cut the piece here, but you could tie this to something like a small embroidery um, and hang it from a window. Some of these beads are prismatic, so uh, hanging in the sun, it will throw some really cool rainbows I had on our test. So I'm going to switch over to a document camera. All right. Away from me. And I'm going to switch to stage mode here. Actually, let's switch to... Yes. Focus. All right. So I've got all my pieces here. 
Um, the pieces you can kind of set aside for now are the little piece of ribbon and the um, suction cup that will hold it up. Initially, I designed it thinking it could hang in the suction cup, um, but this particular suction cup doesn't have a hook that really will work for that. Let me move my mic a little closer just in case. Um, so the easiest way I found to start this um, was with the beads that will go along the bottom of your um, mono cord or fishing line. So I taped the five pieces together um, for just about everybody. So you should be able to open this tape fairly easily and get those pieces apart. But I just didn't want them to get lost because they were just very hard to see, although I'm hoping it's a little easier to see on this red um, tablecloth today. So you should have five little hearts, four bigger hearts, one teardrop, this is the one that gives off the best rainbows, and then these five um, clear prisms that have the two holes in them. I'm just gonna grab one of my fishing lines and probably my prism. So I'm gonna start with the four bigger hearts and my prism first. Uh, let's make sure. So this has a hole. I'm just gonna thread my line through the hole and tie a knot and a double knot. So I started with a two pound test line and it was so difficult to see to make these knots. Um, so this actually bumped up for most of the kits. It's a three pound test. Um, and then I ran out, so I ended up with this eight pound mono cord, um, which actually I just picked up at Walmart in the craft aisle though. So once I've got one tied, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to another one of my big carts. Find the end. So I'm going to do each of these four. Um, putting them together on the string before adding them to the wooden piece um, allowed me to tie them all on the wooden piece at the same time, which made it um, a little bit more stable. The first time I tried this, I just finished one and tied it on and it fell off because it was a lot of weight on one side. Do we stack them on top of each other? Um, so right now we're just doing the four larger hearts and the teardrop at the bottom of each um, piece of fishing line. And then these bigger circles and the smaller hearts will go above them. I'm so oh, confused. won't even be knotted. They just slide right on. <laughs> do, do we stack them on top of each other or do we put in knots to separate them? Um, you're going to want to use each piece. So I've got a piece here that just has one of the bigger hearts on the bottom. A piece here that has the teardrop on it. Okay, I, I see. And then I'm going to take the okay, next piece. So I start a new wire. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, okay, I got Five it. Five wires, one for each heart and the prism or in the teardrop. Got it. I have seen these where you get clear beads and you do just stack them along the fishing line as kind of a single string sun catcher. And I think that would be really pretty too. Although right now, none of us are having that much sun to catch. <laughs> but here in Texas, we'll get some sun again here real soon. All right, so this is my third one. I'm double knotting. And then fourth, let's see. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. They're just little stickers. I had to do it. I had to have some so that, like, I was hoping people could see the differentiation. Because this thread is just so... I almost colored it with a Sharpie. Asked a friend who was, who was a fisherman, <laughs> do they make colored fishing line? <laughs> I don't think they want the fish to know it's there. Yeah, I thought about that after a second. I guess I'm not really a, a fisherman. This is the what? closest to fishing I'm going to get. There you go. <laughs> I've had fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, I do have one more. 
do. Okay, so once we get these five uh, just tied on the bottom of each string, this is where you can um, decide how you want it to look. So what I've given you would be one of each um, for each string, if that makes sense. So one little heart and one circle bead for each one of these strings that has either the heart at the bottom or the teardrop at the bottom. So I'm just going to use my teardrop as the example. Um, these are actually for like a chandelier. Got them on Amazon. I was like, I need things that are going to make pretty sparkles. Yes. So where will I get them? Um, so for the one with the teardrop, in my example, I actually went with a little heart and then the circle bead above it a little ways, um, just because these were both clear and I didn't, I felt like that would work. So for the little beads, their hole is straight down the middle. Um, so how I secured them is, so I'm holding it heart shape up towards me and I'm gonna go down in the top and then, oh wait, nope, I'm sorry. It's up from the bottom because I need to circle back around it. So I'm gonna come up through, but if I just left it like that, it would fall straight to the bottom, but I wanna be able to move it around. So I'm gonna wrap my line and pull, pull it back up through the bottom again. So it's kind of wrapped through there. So I've got it in once and I'm gonna go back up the bottom. Right there. So I've got a loop. If you can see that, my fingers are the loop. And so now it doesn't move unless I want it to. And so I can slide that little baby heart down the thread a little bit farther. Oh, maybe I wanted to be a little bit up a little taller. So that works. So that's for the small hearts. So up through the bottom. I'll do another one here. Small heart. End of my line. Up through the bottom. Bring the line back down and go up through the bottom again. There we go. All right. Get that tight enough that I can have it hold. So now there's that guy. For the circles, um, I really did just go. I'm holding it. I'm going to go in the front on one side, on the, the side closest to the bottom of your string, where your big heart or your teardrop is. And then from the back side, I'm gonna come up. So I've gone, there's my bead on each side. I've gone in the one on the left, and I'm gonna go up from the bottom on the one on the right. So that just has the line right across one side. And the other side doesn't have the line on it. And that actually stays beautifully. It doesn't really move too much. And so you can kind of set that where you'd like it to. Just slide it down the line a little bit. And so we've got those. And this is my other one. Oh God. Um, for the heart one, I actually put the clear one first. So it was color B, clear B, color B. That way, one side into the other. I'm going too fast for anyone or skipping anything. Throw it in chat, or ladies, you can just holler at me. I like this because it's not like it's tying a knot, it was cutting a few pieces. Some of the more involved crafts are not really my skill set. If you if any of the attendees have seen our videos, um, you'll know that our other adult services like librarian Betty McDowell is an amazing painter, and I am not that. But we do Crafty Cafe. We have a lot of fun. 
make some cool things. All right, so I do that to each of the five strings by my larger heart or my teardrop at the bottom. Get my circles, go up in one side and out the other so I can move it along the line as I need. And then for the little hearts, pull the line from the bottom and then wrap it around again and pull it up to the bottom. And then that'll let you move it as you need. So I would have five of these and then I would just um, tie them to the hearts along the bottom. I did kind of design this with the teardrop in the middle, just as it's kind of how it worked out when I was ordering the beads. And again, I'm just really tying this in a knot because it's the fishing line. Like the fish don't see it, we don't see it. So it really hanging up in the window, it looks cool. Right. You know, if I got that second one tied. Up. Right. You're gonna track on time. We're doing beautifully. I don't want to fight with this for more than 20 minutes or so. A good 20 minute craft timetable is pretty good generally. All right. So, um, I will point out with the fishing line, one thing it does like to do is tangle itself. Um, when they are kind of hanging next to each other. Um, but once it's, each one is tied and it's up on a window, um, that they shouldn't tangle each other too bad. I have one that will live now on the window in the Fab Lab. So I'm sure we have some perfectionists amongst us. <laughs> um, I, I personally am, am a little bit more craft as craft will be we'll just kind of do it so like whether you want the middle one to be shorter or longer have it like a v or have them be kind of the same length across is completely personal preference um i think on my original example i tried to make the teardrop bead stay a little longer than the others And the nice thing is, if these upper beads move, you can just move them right back. And so you see the... What I'm talking about with the little tails. So if you have scissors, you just grab a pair of scissors and cut that down so it's not sticking off. Um, quite as far. And adjust as you see fit. So. And really, if you wanted, you could put, you know, that's the great thing with crafting. You can decide you want all these circles on one or all the tiny hearts. Or maybe you have some beads that are something, you know, you got from your grandma or you found it a Austin Creative Reuse, which any local crafters who have not been to Austin Creative Reuse, do yourself a favor and go. It's amazing. Um, the, okay. Excellent. How's everybody doing? Pretty straightforward. Are any pieces giving you trouble? No. Good. Oh, they're crafty. These are tiny knots. <laughs> it is crafty, though, because then at the end you have this beautiful thing that's going to throw rainbows across the room. And look at you made it. It really <laughs> was just tiny knots. <laughs> All right. 
So I think I'm going to leave mine at about that level. This may be like a novice fishing thing to say, but I do like how well the wire holds knots. I was scared, but they hold them so well. I did, I, because there's some of this monocord that's a little bit springier, mm -hmm. and this really isn't. And so um, I, I definitely, one of the first things I did when I got it was tied a couple of these knots on to see how well it would hold, because I didn't want it to kind of loosen and fall apart later. Um, so yeah, it is. And I believe it's because it's the mono cord. It's a little bit more. It doesn't have quite that um, balance that some of that. That other cord is great for things, but this, is, this particular type of craft. All right. So we are just about 20 minutes since we started. So I know we're probably not quite to the end of it. Uh, that's a great thing to happen. You don't even have to finish it the first time around. Switch my video back. To me. All right. Said, um, more questions. I did take your questions to the authors um, as they came in. Um, a few of them were already things we were planning to talk about, which was so great. Um, and then I did some have some questions with authors. I can't imagine that we would even get to those types of questions because people are all awesome. And we have so much to chat about the wonderful romance book. Ah, yes. How did you do your version? Yes. You completed. So let, me, let me switch back. Uh, okay. Good. Thank you. So once um, you've got all of your pieces hanging off the bottom, um, because the hook didn't work for the hole, that's what the little ribbon is for. Um, so I did just, you know, get the ribbon through. And then um, tied a knot in the top of the ribbon to make a hoop so that it would hang on the hook. And the little suction hook should hang, um, should work pretty well on any window. So there. I keep the tail in the back. So I'm now I'm going to switch back again. I can do a little hold up. Oop, that's not what I wanted to do. There I am. Okay. So I've got it um, with the ribbon tied on it. And then I'll be able to put um, a quick suction cup. Should have brought myself up here. Something I can actually suction to. Hang okay, on there. So in any window. See? That's something super simple, like I said, those beads, I mean, some like embroidery boards, um, something I, like I said, I've even seen a kind of single string where it throws those rainbows and it's just like, yay. Wonderful. All right. Here we go. So, all right. Let's talk things in romance books. You are all such wonderful romance writers, and all of us here are such wonderful romance readers. And it has just been kind of the thing that has kept, I'm sure, a lot of us going lately. Um, and we would love to hear about how um, you guys kind of made your journey into writing and whether you are currently a full-time writer. Um, so if each of you would give the audience your broad overview of your journey to writing, I'm going to um, just kind of go around. Um, Lorraine, let's start with you. All right. My journey to writing. Um, I, I do write full time, but even when I worked another job, I felt like I was still writing full time. Uh, if you're going to meet deadlines, it's kind of a not really a part time job. So, um, but anyway, I always knew I wanted to uh, write. I just wasn't sure what I wanted to write. And once I just, as I said in my bio, once I discovered romance novels, 
um, been much of a reader up until that point, and I became a really um, voracious reader, and so I wanted to also write romance. Um, I started writing in 1990, and I sold my first book in 93. Um, it was a Western historical, and I wrote Western historicals for a while, and then I started writing Victorian set historicals. So it's just writing. It's just something I've always done and always wanted to do. Um, so that's kind of how I got into writing romance. Awesome. So I think for you, what was your writing journey? Um, I started writing when I was very young, uh, 10 years. <laughs> I was really into the horror genre growing up. So my first story is very different from what I write now. Um, I continued to write throughout high school and college. And I ended up writing what I... I ended up writing something that, that wasn't um, specified by genre. I didn't I pick a genre and start writing it. It ended up being more of a women's fiction, The Trouble with Hating You, my debut novel. And then I added this strong romance element to it. So then it became a rom-com. <laughs> so I kind of just stumbled. It's kind of worked and wrote my way into what I write now. And I do write full-time. I tend to be a very um, fast writer, kind of prolific. But it's not to say that all of those books and words will make it to print, but I hope so. Um, and yeah, just as, as it was mentioned before, um, I actually started writing part-time, uh, but with all the deadlines and once you get into the business aspect of it, it does become more of a full-time job, whether you're working full-time or not. Yeah. Carolyn, for you, what was your dream? Well, I'm a very much a late looper. I, I loved reading, of course, growing up, like all of us, you know, I, I was reading everything, but... That was a long time ago. <laughs> Back then, uh, readers, uh, you couldn't really access authors, you know? I mean, now you can you can email them and, and get to know them. But back then, no one knew who the authors were. I thought they were all like these magical beings that lived in Scotland, you know, in castles. <laughs> and, and it wasn't something that, you know, a poor girl from Texas could ever do. And so I just... Even though I dreamed of being an author, I put it off for a long time. I actually didn't start writing um, till I was 43. <laughs> and I uh, sold my first book at age 45, and I've been writing ever since. But uh, so I would encourage y'all that uh, who, any readers out there who want to start writing or start doing anything, don't think you're too old. You're never too old. You can always start. And, um, and I'm so glad I did. When I was 43, I just had my 43rd birthday, and I thought, you know, I don't want to die someday and wish that I should have given it a chance, you know? I should have tried. I didn't want to have that regret. And so I, I thought, even if I try and don't make it, at least someday I can say, well, at least I tried. And uh, But in two years, I sold my first book. <laughs> so I'm really glad I tried. And um I'm still trying every day. Uh, every, every book is, seems like you're starting over. Every book is still hard to write. Um, and I, my first book, because I grew up mostly reading historicals, that's mostly what was there. There weren't a whole lot of paranormals back then. And uh, so my first book was an actual historical. And uh, But after that one, uh, my that first publisher dropped me after that first book, and I... I had to start over. My agent dropped me. I mean, I had just uh, I bombed. <laughs> I had to start all over. And that's when I realized that my favorite books growing up, like books like uh, that, that, some of the Jude Devereaux books that I loved the most were actually, even though they were historical, they were paranormal too. And I realized, oh, I actually love paranormal. I think I'll give it a try. And then I was thinking of, because I still love, I've always loved historical. So I was thinking, what kind of paranormal character can I write who's sort of historical? And that's when I thought, well, vampires, because they're, you know, 500 years old or whatever. So I still get my historical fix. I, I could write these really old-fashioned characters and have fun with it. Put them with a modern woman, and that's, you know, that's going to be a disaster from the start. So it's a lot of fun. Um, 
And so that started the Love at Stake series. And I just happened to have one. <laughs> this was the first one. Uh, How to Marry a Millionaire Vampire. And it went up for like 16 books and two novellas. And then I went into uh, fantasy with the Embrace series. And uh, so that's about it. Yeah, there's been five Embrace books so far. Wonderful. And Tracy, what's your journey been like? Well, like everyone else, I grew up reading. I love to read. Um, and I actually wrote as a kid. I wrote um, bad, you know, rhyming poetry and short stories. And I wrote plays uh, for my church. But my parents weren't trying to hear <laughs> me talk about a career as a writer. That just was not a thing uh, in my household, something that was not happening. Um, but it's something that I guess recently I realized it had carried through. So, you know, I got to college and would be procrastinating on studying. I would go to the computer lab. We have that's when I went to college. We had computer labs. Nobody had individual computers. Um, and I would take like three hours. I would write these short stories that featured my friends and whatever boy they had a crush on. Um, and they'd be like 20 pages and uh, it gave me so much pleasure. Like I, I still have like a folder with like about 10 of these stories. Um, and then uh, I remember writing my first, um, at least attempting to write my first romance uh, in the summer between college and law school. Uh, maybe something was like knocking at me like this is your last chance you have to do it um <laughs> but that went nowhere um so I went to law school practice got married had kids um and I ended up staying home uh with my kids and uh the years uh, those are the forgotten years because they are a hazy blur um, but when my youngest started a full day kindergarten, I knew that I was going to go back to work. And I talked to my husband and I said, you know, I'm, I, you know, I love practicing law. So going back and finding a job in law is not a hardship. I'm very happy to do it. But I have really gotten back into reading romance recently. I love it so much. I think I want to try to do this. And he was so supportive and he was just like, if this is what you wanted to do, you know, go for it. Um, and so that was in 2011, I believe it was. And then I got my, fir my first book uh, published in 2014. Um, and I've just been fortunate enough that I've been able to do this full time from the very beginning. So uh, that's how I got here. That's awesome. And you touched on it. Um, you have an audience question, actually. Tracy, you said that your family, like your immediate family, wasn't really supportive of a career as a writer. Um, was your husband pretty supportive when you finally started? Yes. I mean, he was, all, you know, he was supportive from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, for my family, I guess they just didn't see how that was going to be a career where I could, you know, take care of myself, where I could support myself. Like that was their, that was what was most important to them. What kind of career can she have where she can support herself? And, you know, and we are not, I am not, let me speak for me, uh, raking <laughs> into the bucks um, doing this, but I love, I love what I do. Um, and I have been very, I'm very fortunate that I do, um, you know, have a husband and, you know, my kids who are very supportive about what I do and understand the toll it takes on me. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. Carolyn, is your family pretty supportive? Oh, Carolyn, is your family supportive? Of me? Are you writing? Me? Um, Carolyn. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I couldn't hear. Sorry. <laughs> to uh, yes, yes, they're very much so. I, I was actually, uh, while the kids were, I, I was a school teacher for years. And, uh, but after the, we had our third child, I decided to stay home uh, because really <laughs> the, the salary as a school teacher wasn't going to cut it for three uh, daycare places. So, uh, so uh, I decided to stay home. 
and and raise the kids and I loved it but by the time like like Tracy said by the time the youngest went into kindergarten I thought well I was starting to think maybe because I was reading you have to you know when you're raising kids and going crazy you've got to read romance to stay sane and so of course I've been reading romance like crazy but after the, the youngest went to kindergarten I thought mm, maybe I should give this a try and uh but I was so in, I was so sure I couldn't do it and so afraid that I was sort of hiding it and I was re well, I was using one of my kids uh spiral notebooks left over from the end of the year that still had some pages in there and I started writing longhand because I didn't have a computer and uh and one of my son came in and said mom what are you doing and I was embarrassed I was like well I'm trying to write a book and then I heard him run into the bedroom to to you know to my husband I'm like dad Mom's writing a book. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, my husband came out, and he looked so confused, and he's like, you're, I hear you're writing a book. <laughs> and I was like, yes. And he said, well, let me know when you're finished, and we'll go to New York and call it. And I was just dumbfounded because just the, and he said that in all instances, he thought you could just go to New York and sell a book. He didn't know how the business worked, but he, I realized then he believes I can write a book and I can finish it and that that book will be good enough to sell. And just that one sentence, it was just his trust in me was that that's really that really touched me and I was really able to do it and I so I have great support from my family that's amazing Sadie how about for you well <laughs> what I would like to call a very Asian family and in my family um my family doesn't seem to know anything outside of medicine law engineering and business <laughs> writing was always I was told that's a, that's a nice side hobby so I never really pursued it uh, on a professional level until I tried to get published and you know I went through my heart it took a long time it took several years and a couple of agents and when I finally sold and the trouble with hating me my debut novel was actually what I call my accidental sale because it was really on the back burner I didn't think that there was any um, type of love for it out there it was a long story how it came up, but eventually came up, and when I when I was kind of published, when there's finally some type of quote unquote success behind it, when it was something more tangible, my now my parents are you know like WhatsApp is a really big thing for immigrants, especially when you have family living in other countries. So my yeah. dad is always on WhatsApp, um, showing pictures, quoting my book, and telling everyone you know all this stuff, and so it's really nice to hear that now. But I do understand with my family, it was more practical that you should have something where you can support yourself, have something where you can understand what kind of monetary gain you might achieve if you go to school for X amount of years, right? The publishing, you can be an author for two years or 20 years. It doesn't make a difference. It's all about what's going to happen, you know, on the other side, things that you can't control. But if you go to college for four years, for an engineering degree, you have a high chance of getting a job and that kind of income. So it's all about being logical and having something that I was passionate about on the side, um, but always working towards it. So there was no, um, you were kind of wasting your time. It's just like, that's great if you're doing it, but make sure you're also taking care of, of your bills and your income and all this other stuff. So now that I have some time coming in with writing, it's a bit more logical pursuit. <laughs> Lorraine, how um, has your family support been? Um, well, I didn't really uh, tell the family that I wanted to be a writer. Um, so, I mean, I went to college. I got a job um, after college, and it was like Carolyn. I got to a sort of... I hit midlife crisis. And I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do. I need to, to do this. Um, so um, at the time, I just had an electric typewriter, and so after work and after the boys, and the two boys after they went, I would uh, start typing on the story, and I got the first story finished, and 
Ryder, it's no fun. I thought, you know, I can do this. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. I've got conflict. I've got characters. I've got a happy ending. So I can do this. But it's no fun trying to edit and rewrite what you've already written on a typewriter. So I started writing another story. And when I finished it, other. So I had four stories done, and I came home from work, and my typewriter was gone. And there was a computer there. And my husband Ooh, really could afford it at the time. And my husband was like, I think you're serious about this. So, um, and he goes, you know, let me show you how it works. I said, oh, I know how it works. And I sat down and you don't want to input what you've already written. So I started writing another story. And that's the story that I sold. But, um, but yeah. So, so he's been really supportive uh, once you, you know, what I was doing. So. What a sweetie. <laughs> oh, so those are some great stories. Um, so romance happens everywhere. Um, this is kind of just a random fun question. If you had the opportunity to live anywhere, real or fictional, for a year while writing a book that took place in that same setting, no holds bar, like just for fun. <laughs> Where would you um, choose? So, Sajni, how about you? I've actually been thinking about this a lot because I think it's time for a move, especially here in Texas where it's really cold. Um, Hawaii is someplace that I would just like to go at. And I have an idea. And I'm thinking maybe I should just do this and move to Hawaii <laughs> so I can be really in the moment um, and write this. So, Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Tracy, how about you? Where would you go? Um, I would live uh, in the French Riviera. And I would live uh, with a water view and within walking distance of a coffee place and a bakery um, and a restaurant. Cool. I could just write and then I could go down and have my coffee, have, you know, a little snack, eat my food, walk a little bit, and then go back and write, you know, rinse, repeat. That's what I love to do. That sounds amazing. Lorraine, how about you? Where would you go? Well, since I write historical, I would go to London in 1850, but I don't even know, I don't know if I could live there for a whole year. Uh, <laughs> conveniences. But uh, I think it would be fascinating just to to really be able to see how it really was back then. We yeah. not really as romantic or clean as we find it. <laughs> I mean, my heroes are always obsessed with bathing every day, you know? <laughs> it's amazing that they always take all these baths. Carolyn, <laughs> <laughs> where would you go? Well, I don't know if I could go to the Embrace series, another planet. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, Lorraine knows because she was with me in Scotland when uh, we, we, Kathy, and we all went to Scotland and we went to Dunatar, uh, which is a castle on the coastline, the ruins of a castle. It's really beautiful. And I, I based, uh, in the Embrace series, I based uh, the castle there on Dunatar. So I've gotten so much inspiration from Scotland and Norway. And so I, I would be, I'm, I'm torn between the two of those actually. But, oh yeah, I, I, I want to be in one of those uh, igloo hotels where, you know, where, where it's see-through and you sleep all night watching the uh, Northern Lights. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, that's that's sort of uh, that's sort of where my mind's at. I but I would love all the um, the folklore of uh, Scotland or Norway and um, be able to put that into a fantasy book. That would be really fun. Yeah, and well, in your race, you were able to slide in a few other uh, amenities. Let's say, in at least a few things that I thought was really awesome. Um, so for our romances, um, one of the key things is that HEA, that happily ever after. And for you ladies, how important do you feel the HEA is to the romances? And how do you feel about stories that are just happily for the now? 
Um, Carolyn, how about we start with you? I think there's probably a place for the happily for for now, uh, depending on what kind of subgenre of romance you write. If it's uh, if it's an ongoing series, especially if you have like the same hero and heroine in an ongoing series, then then that would make sense. Because if it's happily ever after, you've kind of finished it. So uh, if you're doing an ongoing series with the same um, hero and heroine, I think it makes sense to do it that way. Um, I'm thinking maybe like Karen uh, Marie Moaning series, uh, that that sort of thing, where you have the same recurring characters. Um, my series, I tend to have a different hero and heroine in each book, and so I do want a happily ever after for each each couple. That makes sense for me. Uh, so I, it depends on uh, what you're writing, and uh, I think uh, if you if you're doing uh, Modern modern settings or urban fantasy and stuff, it makes me, me more sense to do uh, Happy for Now. But uh, in the traditional uh, traditional type romance, uh, especially historicals, or uh, I think it makes more sense to do uh, Happy Ever After. Lorraine, you writing historicals, do you feel the same way? Uh, I, I, I do. Feel the same way. Um, when I write young, it's a happily for now because when you're 17, 16, 17 years old, um, I don't think you really know what forever is. Uh, but some do. People can find the right one when they're really young. But uh, so, uh, so I agree with uh, Carolyn that uh, I can depend upon the book and who the audience is for. But if it's a real romance for adults. I always think you have to have the happily ever after. Um, and all, all of my books have a happily ever after with a pro, with an epilogue that shows them years down the road. They're still happy. <laughs> so. I do love those. Sashi, you have a way too. So um, like Lorraine said, do you think that that's kind of the way it is for how's the happily ever after versus happily ever now for you? Um, I think so for myself as well, because I write YA, and as I already mentioned that when you're young, you're younger, <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. You have a lot of life choices ahead of you. you. You may not want to make your happily ever after right now with this one guy or this one woman. Uh, so it, it fits. It fits the book. You have to think about if it's a series, if you have a chance to make it as happily ever after. Um, for, for myself, I don't write series, so I have to have a happily ever after, and that's what a lot of readers expect when they read romance, when they pick up a romance novel, you want that feel good ending, you want that smile on your face at the very end, you want to finish the book, and I want, I want my readers to finish the book and think about this ending for as long as possible, so it's also a goal uh, for myself as a writer. That's awesome. Tracy, how are you dealing with happily ever after versus happily for now? Um, I agree with what everyone said. I, mean, I think, you know, sort of guiding tenet of romance genre is the happily ever after. Um, and, and I agree sort of like with YA is a happily happy for now makes sense. And I know that especially for people who write contemporary, there's an idea that, you know, if the way the world is, that maybe happy ever after isn't um, realistic. Uh, but to that, <laughs> I say it is realistic. Um, it is what I write uh, happily ever afters. I work really hard in my stories to make sure that by the time you reach the end, the characters have done not have not only sort of gotten to know each other and have fallen in love with each other, but they've also done the work on themselves so that they are in the right place to meet and you know have a successful life with the person that they've chosen. Um, so it's not just sort of plot for me. I, I spend a lot of time on internal um, character arcs. Um, and so they have earned that happily ever after by the time we get to the end. And so I'm all about the happily ever after. If it doesn't have a happily ever after or happy for now, it is not a romance. It is a love story. And I will fight anyone who wants to, <laughs> who wants to have a fight about that particular definition. 
I like that differentiation. No, that's great. Because, yeah, I mean, we need a romance for a reason. We need a romance. And we want that, yeah. Some of those stories are great, but uh, happily for now, like, when's now? I mean, now. So, um, we, 2020 was a horrendous year. Books were definitely a source of solace for me. Um, so, for our author, what project you worked on, or maybe even just a book that you read um, that helped you get through all of this? I'm going to start with Tracy on this one again. (laughs) It would, I did not read as much as I wanted to, but that's mainly because I've been writing. um, And when I am writing, I tend to, yeah, I tend to go into a certain space. And um, most of what I read while I'm writing is out of genre. So I, I tend not to read a lot of romance when I'm writing. I tend to read nonfiction. Um, but what got me through uh, 2020 was the book that I uh, am writing, um, which is the next book uh, coming out f- uh, for me. It is a contemporary um, and it involves um, a rapper and a real life dude. So that was really sort of fun to uh, dive into and it was definitely a world unlike what we had been dealing with so it was it was perfect that's awesome Lorraine for you what was uh, something you read or a project you worked on that helped you get through last year um, I was working on um, a book that will be out in the fall called The Duchess Hunt and I have very I have a um, clueless hero and his secretary has loved him for a while, but he just sees her as secretary. And so it was just fun uh, writing a story where he begins to realize maybe she, because he's given, what he did is he put an ad in the newspaper for women to write in applying to be his duchess so that he can marry. And he gave the task to her, choose who I'm supposed to marry, which is a horrible job for her to have, to choose who he's supposed to marry when she's herself. And, but she won't choose herself because, you know, she's the secretary. So anyway, it was just fun working with these characters as they both realized that, you know, the woman he's supposed to marry is there all along. So... That's wonderful. Kelly, for you, what was it that helped get through 2020? I, I want to know about Lorraine's book. What is this secretary? When does this book come out? Pardon? When does, when does it come out, the book of the secretary? I love It'll this. be out at the end of September. The Duchess Hunt. The Duchess Hunt. Okay. <laughs> I love the idea. Get through 2021. That sounds like that was a lot of fun. It was because everybody knows. Everybody knows he loves her except him. <laughs> so it's, it was just, and that's so everybody's working to anyway. Spoilers, <laughs> but <laughs> it was just fun. Well, I gosh, I when I when I'm writing when I whatever I'm writing I I. I I don't read. I try not to read. Like right now I'm writing fantasy. So I had to give up writing, uh, reading fantasy. And when I was writing vampires, I gave up reading vampires. I missed a lot of really good books, but I'm trying to catch up with that now. (laughs) And because, uh, you know, you you want to keep your stuff original and fresh. And if you you read something and you're, I was always afraid that if I read other vampire books while I was writing vampire books that something would get stuck in my mind and then months later I, I would think oh what a great idea but it wasn't really my idea so that was my fear and um so I had to give up uh, reading fantasy lately so I, I but I have been able to catch up on some vampires and um and I, I still my first love is historicals I uh, and the last book I read was actually for, was actually a paranormal though, because Kensington asked me to read this, uh, and it's called uh, to to give him a, a quote, and it's called Fairy Godmother's Ink, 
and it was just it was it's about this small town where the the fairy there's fairy godmothers and all the fairy tale people are actually there and, and it was really fun and really cute so uh when that comes out uh, y'all should look for that that was a cute book i really enjoyed that it was very lighthearted and with 2020 yeah, i needed um I needed the laughs. It was a very lighthearted, light paranormal. Lots of fun. So I think for you, what was the project or thing that you consumed that helped you get through 2020? Um, I also didn't read a lot. I, I turned to my writing to kind of have an escape for what was going on. Um, I, like a lot of people, I'm sure felt the loss of people who passed away from COVID, um, the depression, all of that. And I was fortunate enough to also sell a couple of projects. I was asked to partake of a YA anthology that was like a feel good edge to the whole COVID thing. It's called Together Apart. It came out last fall. And I turned to writing rom-com deeply <laughs> because as, as was mentioned, you have to work out a lot of plot holes and a lot of strings to make sure that your happy ending is deserved and everything comes together. So there was a lot to focus on with writing rock comp, but also to feel um, happy and giddy and have this real escape for what was going on. So I did a lot of writing. I wrote three, three, four books. <laughs> I did a couple of projects. Yes, I went hard <laughs> writing. It was my way of dealing with everything, but also it's just something that I really love doing. So I just continue to do it. <laughs> That's awesome. All basically all kept writing, which. As your readers, we just love you for, and uh, we're so glad that you're getting through this. Um, so we are at 3 o'clock. We've got about a half hour, so I'm going to kind of stick down a little bit to some of the audience questions that we've gotten. Um, some of them we talked about. I know we just said that um, Karen was telling us that uh, what book you were currently obsessed with, um, and what was that, the uh, Fairy Godmother Inc.? Fairy Godmothers Inc. Uh, as an in incorporated, I am. Yeah. yeah, Tracy. How about for you? What's a, a book you are currently obsessed with, if any, or even if you haven't read it? What? Well, well, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not currently obsessed with any book at the moment. I turned my um, I turned my manuscript in March first, and I have this TBR pile that is insane and uh, yeah like i i've said i'm taking march and i'm just going to read every day all day on the couch that is all i'm doing so yeah like march 7th i may have an answer uh, about <laughs> what i'm obsessed with um okay. well, yeah. you will definitely have you've maybe post that on your uh, pages yes. there I, um, I can Wait, I'm so excited to read. Like I, 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 I want to turn this book in, but I'm so excited that I could just be a romance fan for a month. I'm so looking forward to that. Yeah. Saji, is there a book that you are currently obsessed with? I just finished Beach Read. <laughs> and I, uh -huh. I haven't read in so long. I was excited to read again. Um, and in between edits, because I always have so many projects going on. I, I was like, okay, I have to slip in something. And so, um, actually, I, I also listened to this new book, Mexican Gothic, which completely lured me in, and then Beach Read right after, and I was, I'm was i obsessed with both of them, but they're good reads. And I heard they might make it into something. Oh, yes. That's so much. That yes. Amazing. Um, Lauren, how about for you? Is there something that you're currently obsessed with? A book? Um, yeah, I recently read uh, The Black Swan by, um, oh gosh, Karen Robart. Um, and it's World War II. I've been reading, um, well, I had a chance to read last year. I was reading World War II books just because I'm getting ready to write one. Um, so it, it was, it's um, about a singer in France who is actually working as a spy and it was it was really well written and really well done I thought um, so that's my current obsession wonderful um, and JC asks us um, do you have a favorite subgenre within romance um, and then Gordon's question was um, 
like what inspired you to write books of the genre that you write in. So let's kind of combine that too. Um, Tracy, let's start with you. Uh, I read mostly growing up, I guess my favorite um, romances growing up were the Harlequin Prisons and Silhouette Romance, so the small category romances. And so when I began writing, um, Paranormal was big, and I tried writing in Paranormal, and it's not my voice. Uh, so I was sort of stuck between that idea of write what sells and write what you love. So I tried to write what sells, you know, what was popular, and it didn't match my voice. In the moment, I said, well, I'm going to try for Nano to write a category, 50,000 words. I'm just going to try to do this. And the moment I did that, it just clicked because that was my voice. Um, so that is why I write contemporary romance because it's sort of what I love to read and I think it fits my voice best. Um, what I like to, the genre I like to read, I, I like all of romance. Um, my favorite subgenre, probably after contemporary, would probably be like a romantic suspense because I love mysteries. Um, so, probably romantic suspense. And Carolyn, for you, um, what inspired you to write? Kind of touch on this a little bit into the, um, the genre that you write in, and do you have a favorite subgenre that you write? Oh, well, I'm, I, I love other worlds. I love to escape. And so, but, you know, the other world it could be a, an historical world. I love historicals, or it could be a paranormal world or fantasy. And I, I just love that. I love world building. I discovered that when I was uh, writing The Vampires. Um, their world was really a parody of our own, but once I got into the shifters, I realized I, they had to have their own culture and their own uh, reason for being and how they became to be and all that sort of stuff. And and, and so when I started building up their culture and their world, and I, I just loved that. That was one of my favorite things about writing. And, and so uh, that's one reason I, I began the Embrace series, because I thought... You know, ultimate world building, a totally different world. And so uh, I, I've had a great time with it. And um, so the, the, I, I love uh, paranormal. I love fantasy, Lord of the Rings, that sort of thing. I, that's that's the greatest stuff to me. I, I love that. And so that's why I try to write it. Lorraine, is that pretty much the same for you, historical or? And what brought you to be inspired to write those in that day? Uh, yes, it's um, like I read all the genres, all the subgenres in romance, but my introduction to romance was historical. And so it's kind of always been my first love. And so um, I have written a couple of contemporaries, but I think my voice is more suited to historical. So. And I, I just historical and research, and so even though you do still have to research if you do contemporary, so just there's always something to research. So I think for you, do you have a favorite subgenre of romance? Uh, no, I don't really write or read depending on the subgenre. I just kind of go for the story overall, and I have. I mean, my taste across all the subgenres. My first romance book was a um, was a historical, but I know that I never read the historical because I don't have the chops for that. And so, like Tracy was saying, um, I just ended up writing my novel, which is more contemporary. Um, but I I go through the story first and then figure out the subgenres. There. That's awesome. Um, and so I'm going to go to some of our um, author-specific questions because, yeah, Sajni, your debut at me is to love the romantic comedy. It's such a vibrant depiction of the Indian community. Um, is there an aspect that you had to edit out or is it didn't find a home that you really wanted to highlight? There wasn't anything that I really wanted to highlight that was that was taken out, but something that I had to change a bit was the um, aggressiveness, I guess, <laughs> of, the, of our leading lady. Um, she had to tone her back a bit. She has quite a bit of an attitude and very can be very in your face. So in the opening chapters, I had to peel her 
or not peel our back, but uh, pull that back a little bit so that readers, kids find her inner beauty a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, that one's the one thing. That's awesome. Um, for your, I saw on your website, you have playlists that go with your books. Um, how is music a part of your writing process? I've always loved music. Music is so inspiring and it's a story in itself and it always puts me uh, immediately into a certain type of mood, especially if it's a nostalgic song. So I always have playlists for all of my books. It's just a fun thing that I like to do. And it's a, I think it's a fun way to get the emotional sense of my books into readers. Um, and it helps me too. So if I'm editing or writing a scene, I just have my playlist on in the background. And it's also um, a memory trigger that this is a type of emotion from this song that I want to explain to this scene or to into this plot or this entire book. So it's a it's a memory trigger for me. That's awesome. That's really cool. We really probably don't think all of the things that go in. Um, some of our questions were about where you got your ideas from. Tracy, your girl trip series is based on your own group of friends and your annual trips, which is a great idea. Was it one of those trips that gave you the idea for those books? <laughs> Not a specific trip, um, but there there are moments there were moments on the trip where I would look around and just be like not that we I want my own reality TV show I'm not saying but I'm just saying like it would be a moment where I'd be like if people could see sort of this it would be you know crazy like we would go out um, and like go to one specific instance is we were uh, in Jamaica and we were doing a booze cruise <laughs> and they were playing music and people were just sort of like, you know, sitting there. I mean, I guess on the boat, I, I, I don't know, but we were just like, oh, like we're in Jamaica and we're drinking like, you know, drinks and like, just like go crazy. And so we just started like having fun and like talk, you know, like just like trying to get the party started, which we tend to do a lot. And I remember, like, like ten minutes later, looking around and just being like, "This is, you know, you have so much fun." And I love these women, and this is what I look forward to, like every year on these vacations. And so it, it's just like moments like that that just makes me think. I wish there was a way for me to take this energy and love and. And so I remember just jotting down in my notes app just this idea about a series of friends, you know, met in college and still go on vacation together every year. And I remember when the time came for a new proposal, uh, just giving some to my editor and she picked that idea. And I was like, great. Now I have to go and ask my friends and be like, um, I'm going to write this series. I promise I'm going to like move identifying pieces around, but I'm probably going to use some of these stories. So just, you know, round of drinks on me. <laughs> That's awesome. After I wrote it, I know the other half of this question, and this is all me. Um, which type of trip planner are you? I think I'm a lazy. They're never going to let me do it. Um, but thankfully, <laughs> I've got some Avas in my life, too. I see you out there. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm like, I'm a Nick because I truly believe Nick would get to the point where she would just hire somebody to do it. And, you know, when it's my turn, I tend to like turn it over <laughs> to someone else <laughs> to make sure it gets done the way it should get done. Yeah. <laughs> and for you on your website, Tracy, you offer to join book clubs discussing your titles for all of your readers out there. Um, what are your, some of your favorite reader takes on your stories? Things that they come back to you with? Um, most. I think the interesting thing or what I continue to find over and over is that if someone is in a book club and they haven't read me before, after they read me, the thing they tend to say is they were surprised um, because they saw that I wrote interracial contemporary romance. And so they always, they're apprehensive. Maybe they think going into it that uh, 
um, the race is going to be a huge sort of conflict in the story. And I think that makes people apprehensive or you know, worried about reading my book, like they're getting ready to get a you know, big lesson or lecture. Um, but what they find is that the interracial aspect is just about representation. It's just sort of seeing, um, you know, sort of my marriage and my relationship in the genre that I like, um, where both people acknowledge that they are different pieces, but this story is about their relationship and, you know, and the, you know, the issues that they have as a couple, not about you know, who's black or who's white or anything like that. And I find, like I said, that that is a common sort of comment when someone hasn't read me before and they do and they're like, oh, okay, like I thought it was going to be this one thing, but it's entirely different. And I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> it. worked as it is. Um, so, Carolyn, your website calls the embrace, this is great, Game of Thrones meets the Princess Bride. Um, tell us about creating that world. What were the seeds of its creation? Oh, the embraced books. Yeah, it's it's a different world. Um, well, I always love the Princess Bride. I mean, does it everybody? And uh, when I was watching Game of Thrones, and I thought, you know, I'd, I'd like to see something like this, but with the women about women and and, and uh, where the women have power and they're 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 it was just women friendly version of it and uh, so I came up with the idea of the five sisters and they're the five heroines in in the five books and um, and because of the the vampires when I wrote vampires they all had the same skill set you know their their paranormal abilities were all the same because they were all vampires and uh, I wanted to create a world where uh, people had special powers but they were all different I wanted that variety for a change and so I created this world where there's there's two moons and twice a year the moons eclipse each other and on that night any child born on that night has some sort of supernatural or magical power. And so I had lots of fun coming up with the powers. And these, so these five girls, they, do, they each have a power, and, and they're the heroine of each book. Um, and, and they have wonderful heroes that have special powers, too. Uh, when I first started writing them, I thought it would I thought it would be a serious, serious <laughs> I should have known. I didn't get to, you know two pages in and I started being silly. And that's when I realized, okay, I, I cannot write serious. And so this is not Game of Thrones, uh, the female version of Game of Thrones. This is Game of Thrones meets the Princess Bride, because I, I have to be silly. And um, so they turned into romantic comedies. And I've had lots of fun with them. And actually, uh, there's the five of them, but uh, Kensington asked me to do more because I'm out of sisters. You know, the five sisters are done. So uh, uh, we're doing next generation. That's what I'm working on now is uh, it'll be embrace number six, but it's the next generation. So it's one of the, uh, they're 20 years later and, and they've all, all had children. And so you're going to get the children's stories now. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, for the, um, I apologize if the lighting changed. Apparently I've been sitting still a little too long and the lights changed. Um, so when you write a prolific Carolyn and you love series like Love at Stake, how do you keep details straight between books one and 16? And were there any details that you did change or that you wish you could have changed in between? Oh, okay. Uh, well, if you, if you go to my website, you'll see uh, there's a cast list. And it's probably about 40 pages long. It's list every character and all about them. And I, so I had to keep a really careful list of all the characters, everything about them, and um, then when they started actually having children, it got really complicated. Because, you know, you have a you have a vampire, uh, you know, and if he's 
if, if he's 500 years old or 502 years old, you know, there's no difference. But once they, once they started having children, there's a big difference between a two-year-old and a four-year-old or a two-year-old and a six-year-old. And I realized, oh, gosh, I've got to know exactly when these kids were born. So as, as the series continued, so the kids would actually grow up and, and they would reflect their true age. And so I had to make a timeline then. And so I knew exactly when everyone was born and, and so forth. And it, um, it, it became like a book, you know? <laughs> Because, yeah, the 16 books and two novellas, it, there's a lot of information to keep up with. And so it, a lot of it is actually on the website, uh, the cast list. And I had to keep up with the timeline and all that. And, and now with the Embrace series going into book six, I've had to do the same thing with that. I've I had to make a timeline and, and know all about the characters. And, and you have to, even even secondary characters, you need to list them all with each book so you don't repeat names over and over, you know, because you, you can have a cast of hundreds in these books sometimes and you got to uh, keep them straight and not keep reusing names. I also try to uh, make sure not all my names in a book begin with B. <laughs> You try to hit all the alphabet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> These little, little silly things like that to try to keep the, you know, characters. So the, some of that is to help the reader actually to keep the, the the characters apart in their mind. And when when you have when you're working with so many characters. Yeah. Um. Lorraine, um, on your website, we see you're about to embark on a new series. Um, what can you tell us about the Once Upon a Duke? You told us a little bit already. Uh, yes. So um, when I wrote um, uh, Beauty Tax the Beast, uh, the heroine in that book, uh, her father was a duke who was uh, found guilty of treason. And I had been, um, for an earlier book, I had, um, to get information on inheritance laws, if, uh, if there was no one to inherit a title, I knew the title went extinct, but I couldn't, I had a widow, and I didn't know um, how she would be addressed. If the title became extinct, would they wait until after she passed to make it extinct, or because um, her, her husband had passed and there was no one to go for the title to go to. I'm making this way too long than it needs to be. Anyway, I ended up contacting the registrar at College of Arms in London and I told him I was having difficulty finding this information and I really didn't expect him to respond. And he did. He came back with a long letter about how it all worked and he happened to mention that if the Lord was convicted of treason, then everything was taken away from him and his family was just left destitute. So in Beauty Tempts the Beast, the heroine was found guilty of treason and her family is left destitute. And she has two brothers. Because I thought it would be interesting to explore, think you're going to be Duke and you've ra you're raised to become Duke and then suddenly the titles are stripped of your family you have nothing, you've got to, you're a grown man who has to practically start over. And so that's, um, so her, so she was in that book and that's her story, how she dealt with them losing everything. And so the next book, so then I took the two brothers and made them be um, Once Upon a Duke series. And the first book, uh, at the end of March, and that scoundrel of my heart, and that's her. Her the younger brother uh, is adjusting to life um, without being part of society any longer, and um, so the series was supposed to just be the two brothers. But then, in uh, Scoundrel of My Heart, I introduced a Duke. Who's and he ends up being on the, the hero in the Duchess Hunt, so the series became three books, or just two. Um, I'm sure, I'm, I won't say I'm sure, 
But I find that very often when I write a book, a character will come out and just be so strong a character that his story has to be told next, even though it's not what you planned. And sometimes that is what you had planned for that series or for that book. So anyway, it'll end up being a three-book series instead of a two-book series now. Fortunately, it was a duke, so it fits with the Once Upon a Duke film. So. Perfect. <laughs> Um, you also release titles under several names. Um, how does using different names help the life of the book that you write and the or any story that you get to write that way? Um, I write under different art. I wrote under different names because um, I was writing different uh, for different audiences. So uh, Rain he writes um, adult romances. And my other names, um, Rachel Hawthorne and Jay Parker, write teen romances. Um, so I wanted just to be make it very clear to anyone who was purchasing the books as to whether they're getting a book adult or they're getting a teen, right, a teen reader. Um, but the books are very different. Uh, like Lorraine writes historical and Rachel writes... Uh, contemporary. Um, so it helps um, me writing for the different um, for different audiences gave me a little bit of a, a vacation. After writing historical, then I could go and write my teen book, and then I'd come back to historical. And then my son and I wrote a series together, and that was as J.A. London, and that was a vampire series um, for teens. But um, so it really just had to do with me wanting to be sure people knew what they were buying if they bought a book under a particular name. That's great. Um, so we are just five minutes away from three thirty. Um, I've got a couple of writery type questions. I'm going to kind of lump together for our last question, and then we'll just have you guys um, touch on your next project. And we'll say have a wonderful afternoon and stay warm. So for our writery questions, um, just talk a little bit about what is your writing routine and any advice that you tend to give new writers. Um, and when you're writing and life gets in the way, how do you force yourself to let them down? Um, so let us start with Karen. Oh, well, life is getting majorly in the way for me lately. Uh, a couple of months ago, my husband, well, last March, I lost my father. And then a few months later, my husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So I've become a caretaker. That's really my priority right now and uh we're fighting to keep my husband alive and he's a real fighter and i think we may make it you know we're we're, we're working hard at it and uh so the the writing though is a solace it's uh, a place to go you know an escape and but Anyone that's been a caretaker, you know, it's a 24-7 job and finding the time to escape is difficult. And, I, you know, I snatch an hour here or there. Uh, so I can't really speak right now to a set schedule. I grab the time when I can. And um, at Kensington, that's uh, publishing the Embrace series right now. They've been super duper sweet about it and understanding so they gave me a really long you know usually you're trying to write a book about every six months or so they gave me a year to to write this book and uh so uh and even that's going to be difficult but uh, so the next book that's coming up is uh is book six and embraced and then we have a title for it when when the princess proposes and uh, it's about Princess Eviana, which is uh, the daughter of the, the first heroine, uh, Luciana. And um, so, I, I, you know, that, that is my escape because it is another world. And it's a world where, uh, you know, happy ever after and everything comes true. That you, and, uh, you know, heroes and all the good stuff, you know, flourishes there. And uh, so that's a good place to go and um, to keep me going. Yeah, where you say what happens. 
Ajni, how is your, what's your writing process um, like, and what do you do to make yourself knuckle down to it? Um, I don't really have a process. I just kind of wing it. <laughs> Sometimes if I'm writing something a little bit more complicated, like I, I do write fantasy as well. I don't have anything published in fantasy, but I, I like to write it. And so with that, I like to have like a storyboard and character sheets and all that. Um, as far as everything else, and as well as the outlines, as far as everything else, I just kind of write. And I write when I have time. I do that. I'm not going to always have to get as much done. And I also have the ability to know when my edits will be coming in from my editors. Um, and I have like three or four <laughs> because I'm across multiple publishers. So I can foresee when edits might come in, though. So that helps me to push myself a little bit to try to get this writing part done or this project done or these revisions done and into my agent um, before those edits come in. So Everything is about me pushing myself. No one is micromanaging me. No one's, someone might say, yes, you have a deadline. No one is making me sit down and write. So I have to make myself do that. But I also try to remember, despite what part of the process that I'm in, because I don't particularly like edits or big revisions, it hurts my head <laughs> quite a bit. I feel bad. Um, I, I try to remember how long it took me to get to this point and why I enjoy writing and why what I want to share with my readers. So it's like those little mental things that, that I need to get myself through and to find more joy in what I'm doing. Wonderful. Marie, what's your writing process like and uh, how do you make yourself double down? Oh, my writing process is uh, I'm not a outliner. I just Right. Um, I usually have a scene or um, see, see the characters, and so I just write what I know, um, what I know about them, and then just try and tell the story as it goes. Um, so my process, my process is not for everyone, but what I will say for anyone who is thinking about writing is that writers, I think. Every writer has their own process and that what um, you need to do is just find what works for you um, as a writer. And um, don't feel like you have to follow somebody else's path. Uh, we all have our own paths uh, in writing. And I, I know I attended my first conference and I went to a workshop and everything the speaker was saying was she was saying that the stuff that I was doing was wrong I mean she didn't know I was in the room that that was my process and I was just like why did I do this workshop <laughs> and so you have to take everything with a grain of salt um and as for you know sitting at the desk and, and writing um there are days where it's easier to sit at the desk um, and write and days when it's just harder. Um, but again, uh, I think you just have to to realize that, that too is part of the process. Sometimes the story cooperates and sometimes it doesn't. Um, Nora Roberts will tell you that it's easier to edit a page with words on it than just to edit a blank page. And so, you know, you just have to just keep writing and know that eventually you're going to get there. Um, and, uh, so, a matter of doing it. Yes. Tracy, how about for you? Uh, Lorraine took exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> um, I, I do have a process. I am a person who is very, um, I like order and um, I don't like chaos. I like to, things to be repetitive. Um, so I tend to have a schedule that I follow every day and that actually calms me and makes me feel good. Um, <laughs> so that is sort of what I do. I come to my office and I write uh, every morning because I'm a morning person. And I mean, I think as Lorraine said, that's the thing that I would tell writers is to figure out what works for you and do what works for you. Um, in the romance genre specifically, 
we are, we are, we're giving, like we like to help people. And so if someone asks us a question about our process or what we do or how it works, like we are more than willing to open up and tell you those things, but in no way uh, should that be, um, you know, a hard line. Like just because I get up and write in the morning doesn't mean that is the only way you do it. And if you don't do it that way, you're doing it wrong. Um, I think knowing yourself, if you're a person who tends to write better in the afternoons, don't change that. Just figure out how to make that work for you um, and, and, and everything else in that sort of way. Just what works for you, what gets the best out of you, that's the thing, you know, that I think that you should do. That's wonderful. You ladies have really made this. Your strange 13th. Of course it's the 13th. Why didn't I think of that before? Romance Reader Social, just amazing. Um, as best as we can do it. Thank you to everyone who stuck with us all the way through. Um, we, as I recorded this, will share it on the library pages soon. Um, so just last bit. Um, Tracy, what can we look forward to from you next? Uh, it's the new American uh, Royal series, uh, American Royalty series. The first book, I believe, is March of 2022. Um, it's a contemporary, and like I said, it's about a rapper um, named the Duchess and a real life a real life Duke. And I'm really excited for people to read it. That's amazing. I think what do we got from coming from you next? We just this got the knockout. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> Forever ago. It was only two weeks ago. <laughs> this month. Um, I, so my debut novel was A Trouble with Hating You. The companion novel to it, uh, the follow-up with Preeti story is coming out this September, which follows her um, returning, perhaps, <laughs> to the love of her life and how things kind of clash and what really happened in their relationship and what's going to happen with them in the future. And then right after that, I have my next YA it's a vibrant um, story about an Indian girl who's trying to get into music college. It's called My Sister's Big Fat Indian Wedding. <laughs> it's got all the volume and stuff in there. So that's what I have coming up. <laughs> awesome. Lorraine, um, what else? We've touched on a few things, but what do we got coming next for you? Uh, so March 30th, Scoundrel of My Heart, which is the first book in the Once Upon a Dukedom series. And Carolyn, you talked about the Embrace 6. Is that the next thing we'll get from you? Yes, yes, but it won't come out till uh, 2022. It's all right. We'll write it for it, for <laughs> sure. Um, again, thank you, everyone. Um, these wonderful authors each have um, beautiful websites where you can contact them and find out about new and upcoming titles. Uh, follow them on social, follow the libraries. So at an hour and 32 minutes, I'm going to stop our recording.